and <clears throat> we're live. Hello everyone, this is Dwight Woods, the Jeet Kune Do Rebel, and welcome to the I Love Jeet Kune Do. I do that all the time. Welcome to the Jeet Kune Do Dialogues, episode number 70, with uh, Dean Lessie, and uh, he, we are actually uh, coming on like 10 minutes uh, early, uh, hey, Dale, Dale Barger's here, Adam's here, Hector's here, Sifu Nick is here. Jeez, you guys were just waiting to pounce on this. I love it. I love it. Um, I think Dean has, is, is on a, a, a bit of a tight schedule, so um, we, uh, we decided to come on a little bit early. Uh, Sifu Randy's here, Kevin Burgess is here. All right, so um, hang on one second. He's messaging me. He's messaging me right now. All right, guys, hold on a sec. Let me just make sure, yeah, the invitation was sent, right, okay. Uh, Christopher Q is here, who else was that that came on? Greg Adamson, how you doing? Mark David Collins is here, I think I got Kevin before. All right, so um, hang on and uh, Mr. Lessie should be here in just a second. So while we're doing this, um, let me check my notes here, give you guys a breakdown for, hey, Victor Cook, for what's happening. Um, okay, William Gilmore is here. Neil McLeod, Neil McLeod, I saw, I saw you on with, uh, I saw a short video of you with um, Mick Tully. We got to get you on the show, Neil McLeod. All right, okay, so Mr. Lessie, uh, he's come on. Steve Vissenjou. I hope I didn't mess your name up, Steve. Who else was there? Robert Wolski. All right, cool. Okay, so. Um, Good afternoon. Man, I got to tell you. <laughs> you're a good-looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So here's the thing. Right. Well, okay. First things first. I got to tease you. What happened? <laughs> what happened? Well, uh, back in about uh, 2007, we needed to raise some money for my competition team uh, to attend the International Kickboxing Federation uh, World Tournament. So we had this crazy idea. We'd auction off my dreads. No. Really? And, uh, we we raised quite a bit of money and uh, everybody that uh, purchased one got to either cut it off themselves or, you know, it was a kind of a big deal. So yeah, we kind of did it. I miss them. I miss them. Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must've raised a ton of money cause that was a lot of hair. Yeah. I had them for uh, 11 years. They were, uh, they were pretty long at that time. Yeah. Yeah. As, as we, as we say in the islands, you got that good hair. <laughs> <laughs> so what's up man how you doing i'm doing great all right so here's the thing right so i i didn't get a chance to tell everybody but i am pretty sure that you and i have never met in person that's not true we did we met uh a long time ago at a seminar at the minnesota Cali group at sifu rick Fay's old gym above the thai restaurant on washington Avenue. Oh, man. You know, that was 27 years ago or something. <laughs> it was a while back. Right. You know, I was 14. How old were you? <laughs> I might have been uh, 10 or so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, so I actually wanted to, I wanted to start with it. Well, I wanted to tease you about the dreadlocks first, but, but here, but here's the other thing that I wanted to do, right? I'm going to drop some names, and I, I'd like for you to tell me your relationship with them. Okay. Okay. So we already mentioned Rick Faye, so let's start there. Okay. Um, started with Sifu Rick, oh, I think the first time was 1986. My friend, good friend Tim Mosel and I were training partners. We, we uh, kind of were in the arts together here in Iowa, 
and uh, Tim had met Rick Fay and uh, wanted to, you know, we've always loved Jeet Kune Do, Kali, Muay Thai. Um, and so through Rick uh, and Tim uh, becoming friends, uh, Tim brought Rick Fay down to Dubuque, Iowa, where we're from, for a seminar. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of made a connection with us and, and Rick and the Minnesota Collie Group. So then uh, we started traveling <clears throat> up to Minneapolis, you know, quite a bit to train. And right. then whenever Rick would have somebody in for a seminar, whether it be uh, Guru Dan Inosanto or uh, uh, Grandmaster Chai or Paul Bunak or, you know, people like that, we would we would travel up and, and train or we'd travel up and stay for a week and just go to all, all the classes at the Kali group. Okay. Okay. Because that was that because that's what I thought also. When I first saw the name of your group, the Dubuque Martial Arts Group, right? Mm -hmm. I go, that's gotta be a Rick Fay influence in, in some shape or form. Yeah, you know, Rick Fay, I like to he had a huge influence on, on me. Uh Kind of the way I, I teach, um, he's just always had a great way of presenting it, mm -hmm. uh, using humor and common sense, mm -hmm. and just he he clarified things a lot yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, so I pattern. I think I pattern a lot of the way I teach. I like to say in tribute to Rick because uh, he's been a huge influence on me in my martial arts journey. Yeah. Is, is the Iowan sense of humor, like the Minnesotan sense of humor? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that depends. Do you think that's a good sense of humor or, or a bad sense I, of humor? I, I, I would pay money. <laughs> I would pay money to be in a room with Greg Nelson, Rick Fay, and Eric Paulson. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Forget martial art. Right. You know, just, oh, yeah. just just have the three of them start talking. Yeah, those right. are three great guys. Yeah, right. definitely. I would I would pay money for it. Okay, Tim Mosel. Yep, Tim Mosel and I have we met. I think we we're freshmen in high school. I I we had a, a mutual friend, and he had known that I was interested in martial arts, and he knew Tim was, so he kind of brought us together. Ah, and uh, we kind of started training at a there was a taekwondo club at the local college, Loris College, and we started training there together. And then we kind of started doing our own thing, you know, off the side, you know, we were fascinated with Jeet Kune Do, Kali, right. uh, Muay Thai. So we, you know, gobble up any information we could find on, on that stuff. And we get together and work out and practice yeah. uh, while still maintaining, you know, our training in, in the local, uh, martial arts school here because that's all we had right right um, right but yeah tim and i were partners for a while when he went away to college at the university of northern iowa um he started a group down there and we kind of started a group here too so when he would be gone i kind of ran things here in our hometown and he'd come back on the weekends and teach and i teach during the week got it um it's called the academy of eclectic martial arts and that was you know tim's school and i was kind of his partner yeah. um and then when he left to go to graduate school in uh, mobile alabama i kind of took it over that was 1990 and that's when dubuque martial okay. arts group was born okay now you have a good pronunciation of it dubuque that's like a, so <laughs> are, are you so here's the thing so many years ago there was a thing on tv how the states got their shapes and that uh -huh. int that introduced me to the fact that there's a lot of French history in Iowa, in Michigan, right. and what have you, which I never. So, so is your last name French in origin? No, ah. no, it's Italian. My last name is Lisi, and it's Italian. Um, and uh, but you know, Dubuque is French, and it's founded from uh, uh, there was a French fur fur trader and trader, right. uh, Julian Dubuque, and that's where right. Dubuque. Got, yeah, got yeah. It never, it never, it never dawned on me until I saw that. I mean, even even the more. Yeah. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Pete Hetrick. Okay. Yeah. Pete. Pete was uh, in Wisconsin. We met Pete, you know, through seminars and found out he wasn't too far from us. He was in uh, Janesville, Beloit, Wisconsin, and he was bringing people in like uh guru dan and osanto sifu hartzel um 
uh, and just different instructors. And then he had a camp. He used to have this Wisconsin camp. I think his first one is in, was in 1990 where he was bringing, I think the first camp he had, Guru Dan, Grandmaster Chai, Sifu Hartsa, uh, Simu Paula was, was there as well. Mm-hmm. Bert Bull, um, who else was there? Oh, uh, was it Pendekar? Pendekar, Paul de Trois. Oh, really? As well. Yeah. Um, I may be leaving a couple out, but it was an international camp. Um, and you know, we became friends with Pete and we'd travel to seminars all around, uh, the Midwest and we'd yeah. always see Pete and became good friends and trained a lot with Pete over the years. And, and he's a good guy. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of good stories back <laughs> seminar trips. <laughs> Actually, I think, I think it was Pete who said, don't tell me all the stories on this interview, save them for the <laughs> book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's, he's probably right with that because uh, there's, I, we probably have quite a few stories, uh, you know, between Tim Mosel, Pete Hetrick, and I, and some of our adventures on the seminar yeah. circuit back in the day. Yeah. All right. Okay. So you got to do something for me. This is a two-part question, and then okay. and then and then two subparts. What is a truss, and how does it work? Okay, a truss is like it's the skeleton of the roof system and it kind of is the frame that uh sets on top of supporting walls it's it's the skeleton of the roof so it's the structural part of a roof okay what triangular in shape and they're made up of triangles patterns which is a very strong structural member okay what is a teep and how does it work (laughs) A teep is a Muay Thai technique, and it is also known as a foot jab, and it is similar to a front kick in that it it goes on a straight line, and it can be used offensively and defensively. Uh, uh, Defensively, we use it to create space or to stop an advancing opponent. Offensively, you can use it to probe and, and set up different techniques. Okay. Now... Which of those two was more fun to answer? <laughs> the second one. Of okay. <laughs> right. The, the reason I ask you that is because what I want to know is so, but so martial art is not full time for you? No. Okay. And never has been? No, it hasn't. Okay. All right. That's why, that's why I brought, I brought those, that, that question up. Right? right. Did you ever flirt with the idea of it? Oh, I would, I would love to be able to do that. It's just never, um, never presented itself, or I've never taken that that leap. Um, prior to being a uh, uh, like a steel truss designer, I was a tool and die maker for several years. I'm a journeyman tool and die mold maker, so I always had that full time gig. Where I've been working 50 plus hours a week since I graduated from machinist school back in 1987. Right. Um, so always have been training, teaching, you know, in the evening classes or the, the weekend classes. And that's still how it goes to this day. Yeah. Uh, that's what I was telling the, the, I was telling the group before you came on that, um, you know, it's probably a good thing that we started early because you are on a little bit of a tight schedule even today, huh? Yeah, I, I, once we're done, I, I head to the gym. I got a two-hour Muay Thai class I'll be teaching uh, tonight. Yeah. Uh, and then Saturday, tomorrow morning, uh, my son and I and several members of our of my Muay Thai team are traveling to Peoria, Illinois, where my son Luke and I will be teaching a Muay Thai seminar. Okay. All right. So, son Luke, did you see the postcard that I made for today's program? Yes, sir. That kid is your stunt double. <laughs> Uh, he, he's a little he's a little heavier than me yeah that kid is your <laughs> stunt double man i was like it's the same goddamn face it really <laughs> is it really is um so 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 competition because that seems to be a, a a big focus at mm-hmm. at at um at dmag right yeah. um and that's born from your days as a competitor huh yeah well you know we we've gone through phases at my gym where you know we were mainly 
JKD and Collie oriented. And we went through a phase where we did a lot of uh, the Escrima competitions um, in the Dose Pares with the- The WeCalf the stuff. The Arnese Federation. Yeah, yeah. WeCalf. Um, and it just kind of went through stages, you know, when I was fighting, my gym was really, it's still the same gym, but it was numbers wise, it was a lot smaller. And it was mainly started it as a place for me to train and have people to train with. Right. Um, and so it was kind of more geared toward that. Um, and as we kind of went through, I had more people interested in, in Muay Thai and, it, and it, Muay Thai is something I really enjoy and it's kind of my passion. Mm -hmm. So once I retired from actively fighting, I just, you know, my guys wanted me to start, start training them and it's just kind of went from there and it was more infrequent. We didn't fight as much, uh, back in the older, you know, days when we were first getting going, there wasn't that much available. Yeah. Um, you might have the, the IKF tournament once a year or a couple of regionals once a year. Um, and, and, and when it first started, if you were a, a Thai boxing association gym, we didn't fight each other because it right. was kind of like we were brothers and yes. you didn't want to fight. You know, I wouldn't fight a John Gregg's guys. We wouldn't have our students fight or, or, you know, anybody who was a, a TBA, we didn't fight. And then it was like, well, who are we going to fight if we don't fight each other? Mm -hmm. um, so with, let me back up a little bit. And th when we got into the tournaments, um, you know, the Thai boxing sanctioning authority tournament was big and it's grown huge. Yeah. Uh, they're going to have record numbers this year, but that kind of started get making more smaller shows happen throughout the area. Um, and my fighters want to be more active. So we just started branching out. We, we've been lucky over the last couple of, couple of years, we have a promoter that's not too far from us. That's bringing shows to our town. Okay. Um, um, but there's just been more tournaments available, more smaller local or right. driving distance shows. So we've been busy with, with training, like almost every month we got fights. And, and it's, it's, um, you, you guys are primarily or only Muay Thai competition or, or do you have BJJ guys and MMA guys and what have you? Um, I do have a, a small grappling group, uh, yeah. that has competed on, on jujitsu tournaments or other, you know, submission grappling tournaments. Yeah. Um, Primarily, we compete in Muay Thai and kickboxing uh, shows, but I do also have a few MMA guys that uh, that come to me to to get work and train. Uh, primarily, they're striking, but they'll also come to my grappling class mm -hmm. um, and, and get some work there as well. But okay. mainly, our competition team is Muay Thai uh, oriented, and we'll take kickboxing as well just to keep keep busy. Okay, so so your your um. Your your fighting nickname was Lethal Legs, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Is Luke's Junior Le Lethal Legs or Little <laughs> Lethal Legs? <laughs> when he first started as a as a kid, that's what he wanted to go with was Little Lethal Legs. Yeah. Um, and then uh, there was one seminar trip. This is a funny story. One seminar trip. One of my assistant coaches, Kevin Drake, and I. Luke was little. He couldn't have been more than nine or ten years old. Uh, he was tagging along with us. And he wanted his fight name. He was telling us Sirius is, is, you know, everything. You know, he wanted his fight name to be the Lethal Chicken of Death. He thought that was <laughs> that was a good one. We kind of had a good chuckle out of that and thought, well, maybe that might not go over so well. But it was about 2015 at the TBA tournament. Um, one of my other fighters, uh, Jack Edens, uh, Luke was doing really well in that tournament and was using his uh, – his foot jab and mm -hmm. was just ser serving up his foot jab was ja what Jack said, man, you're really serving up those teeps. You're like a chef. Um, so that's where my son's current fight name was born. Hey. The chef Lucy. <laughs> hey, do you know, you know, uh, Ron Kosakowski and Jesse James? No, no. Cause, cause, your your stories and and journeys are kind of parallel really like, yeah 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 because um i think even this weekend if i'm if i got it right jesse james is i think he's going for his fourth pro fight mma fight okay in um in in connecticut i think okay 
Yeah, yeah. You, 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 I, I'm, I'm gonna talk. To, I'm gonna talk to Ron. Put him in touch with you. I think you guys would have like an interesting um, discussion about journeys. Oh, oh. yeah, for oh. sure, for sure. All right. So, um, are you a, a, a Smoky Mountain graduate? No, I kind of came to that right after that. I know uh, Rick Fay and and Ajahn Greg. They have stories that you know we used to hear. Those camps kind of ended right as we were. Tim Mosel and I were coming in and getting uh, kind of into the, I'll say, the, into with the Kali group up in Minneapolis. Okay. It was right toward the end of that. Um, and, you know, that's kind of when Pete Hetrick kind of started his camps. Right. In, in uh, Janesville and Beloit, which was great because that got us, uh, kind of got me into it with Sifu Hartzell, uh, who did spent a lot of time in the Midwest yes. back in the, in the 90s. And we, I yeah. was fortunate enough to get to be his uh, Uki and get thrown around him, you know, by him quite a bit on okay. the seminar circuit when he was in the Midwest. Uh, so, yeah, the late, great Sifu Hartzell, yeah. uh, he, was, he was one of the best. So that's what led to instructorship with him? Correct, yeah, right? through okay. him in the Midwest. And uh, he, uh, you know, we, we had him here in our, at my gym a couple, like three times for seminar. And one mm -hmm. was he was conducting testing. Um, he used to go to Pete, Pete Hetrick's quite a bit every year. Rick Salo in Chicago at the Akai Training Hall was in yeah. Skokie back in those days. He'd bring Sifu Hartzell in. Yeah. Um, and there was another guy in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, named Phil Peters. He was on the police department down there. He'd bring him in uh, once or twice a year. Um, so, yeah, we, got, we were spoiled because uh, Sifu Hartzell was doing a lot of seminars throughout the Midwest. At right. Tigerberg Academy in Chicago, he'd be there, you know. We, we got to travel around. I mean, back then, it was like every weekend you were Friday night getting off work and getting ready to leave either early Saturday morning or heading mm -hmm. out Friday night to yeah. a seminar in Chicago, Minneapolis, Beloit, Wisconsin, yeah. or somewhere. What do you make of the fact that it's still like that? I mean, there's many more people now, but mm -hmm. still, every weekend somewhere, there's a JKD or JKD-related seminar going on. So we're yeah. talking, you know, so we're talking, we're talking 30, 40 years of this thing. What, yeah. what, why is that? What do you, what do you make of that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, I guess there's always that fascination. I mean, it's like the way Rick Faye used to, you know, kind of influence us was the, the motion and the, the training methods. And it's, you know, it, it's fascinating to people. So there's always that, uh, that newness of something that's not so new anymore, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's, but there's always things added to it and they're mm -hmm. changing things. Um, I just think the popularity, you know, continues and, and as more people, you know, get, get a taste of it, they, they get that hunger too. Cause it's not as readily available all over either. I mean, we were primarily seminar trained right. back in those days. Cause we didn't have the luxury of having somebody close to us like, Guru Dan or, or Sifu Hartzell or Grandmaster Chai or, you know, the, the people that possess the art that yeah. we wanted to learn. Yeah. If we wanted to learn it, we either had to move out to L.A. or or see them on the weekends at seminar. And you might see them every other weekend because they were always traveling. Mm -hmm. um, and what we would do is we would we would go to that seminar and we'd take our notebooks and we'd take that material and then we'd go back to our gyms and we just, you know, delve into it and train that and get it down until the next seminar. And then we yeah. get more, you know, and yeah, that's kind of how, how it went. Do, do you remember your intro, the, your intro to Inosano? Do you remember when that was? Yeah, that would have been, uh, I, th I think my first one was at the Minnesota Collie Group when Rick Fay, Sifu Rick brought him up there and we got to attend and I was just, like most people I imagine when they see him for the first time are blown away, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of like a rock star thing, you know, for, for us martial artists, he was the guy you'd see in the martial arts magazines. He was Bruce Lee's friend, you know, and he trained with Bruce Lee and, um, you know, you're a little awestruck struck and, mm -hmm. you know, or a he, lot awestruck. Well, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> he and just, you know, I was mesmerized and kind of blown away, you know, watching him show stuff. 
And I, I realized the first time I saw him, you know, every time he showed the same technique, it was never the same technique. There's always little nuances, you know, he, it's like, I don't know, he couldn't do it the same way twice because it's just his brain works so yeah. fast and there's yeah. so much material in there. It's like, yeah. well, you can do this, 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 and this, or, but he tried to show you what he, what he showed originally so everybody could practice that, but yeah. <laughs> you got five or six variations and you, and you just, okay, he'd say, okay, go ahead to practice and you just kind of stop and look and like, what are you doing? <laughs> Which <one> is- <laughs> We're just, yeah. Saw so much, you know? Yeah. The, the, does that happen to you in teaching too? As far as like the, the nuances or, or, or the people come to you and they go, well, you know, when you showed it the second time, it kind of wasn't exactly the same way. <laughs> what my students accuse me of sometimes is, you know, I'll start out a comp like for, um, if it's Muay Thai, for example, yeah. I'll show a combination or for the pads or something and I'll forget maybe the level of the people I have and I'll show them, okay, now the first technique, first combination is this and bang, bang, bang. I'll show the combination. Okay. Now they'll think that's it. And they're going to go practice. And I say now combination number two, and then I give them three, four or five scenarios. And then they're looking at me like, what? <laughs> but yeah. I, I kind of, you know, get into it too much sometimes and uh, get excited and get ahead of myself, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, so you, you mentioned back, back then, um, machinist school and tool and die stuff. Uh-huh. That's, yeah. that, that could be considered like classic old school stuff, right? Yeah. Skilled trades and, and, uh, yeah. yes. Okay. So, so does that, does that make you classic old school in your approach to martial art or have there been innovations that you that you've implemented in your years of teaching and what have you? Yeah, I think one thing it's taught me um, as far as in my teaching is attention to detail. Um, ah. you know, being a tool maker, you have to have tolerances within a thousandth of an inch, for example. So you have to be accurate and you have to pay right. attention to everything. You can't right. you can't be sloppy, and the technique's got to be right, and the form's got to be right. Um, and, but I, I, I like to think of it as old school. I like the old training methods. You know, I still do a lot of things the way, uh, Grandmaster Chai made us work our butts off because I remember what he, you know, he used to say to what I'll call us the old school guys Mm -hmm. was I go hard on you because I need you to help me, you know? So he wanted us to go through the hardship so that we knew what it took to be uh, at that level. Mm -hmm. Um, But I will say I have, I I keep that old school mentality, but I am open to new and better ways. So I've I've adjusted some of the things I do. I'll take, you know, some different uh, training methods and I'll, I'll watch things and learn and, uh, you know, some of the different functional fitness things I'll incorporate in for my guys, you know, right, right, different, different conditioning, yeah. strength and conditioning things for them, you know, yeah. but to me, a lot of the old school stuff is, is tried and tested and proven and it, it, it still works. You'll, you'll be a good guy to answer this for me. Cause one of the, for me, new things that I've seen is where people slap the focus mitt as the guy is punching. Uh-huh. So they slap his punches. Right. What is that about? Am I, it, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me, but am I missing something? Yeah, that reminds me of it. There was a video, somebody, I don't remember who did it, but they showed the different kind of pad holders. It was, uh, it was on social media, you know, and one of them was the, the guy that's always smacking your, yeah. your, your, your gloves when you're punching, you know, the way we do it, you know, you are giving them back a little bit. I always tell my, you know, my students, when they're holding, you want to give them that little bit of pop back, but you're not trying to jam their wrists. Right. You know, yeah. it helps give them that little bit of impact, you know, and it, it, it kind of helps speed their hands up too. The faster you move your hands, you're kind of help bringing their speed along. Okay. Um, that's the way I look at it. Okay. Yeah. Cause you, you know, the old school right. way, uh, box, some of the boxers used to do it. Okay. Because to me, it's like the focus mitt represents the head. So I don't want to be pushing my head forward 
you know, <laughs> into, <laughs> into the guy's punch, yeah, right? Some people over-exaggerate it, and all they're doing is creating bad habits, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Intro to Ajahn Chai. Um, that that would have been, oh, let's see, when was the first time I trained with Minneapolis, Minneapolis I believe, at the wow. Collier. Wow, wow. Yeah. And that would have been about 19, I want to say 86 or 87 was our first seminar with Grandmaster Chai. Okay. And man, that was, <laughs> he, he used to not be happy until three people threw up, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh man. Yeah. But I uh, loved it. I of loved course, it. of course. Um, the... Um, but why competition? Because that seems to ha to have been uh, uh, an integral part in your development. So, so, I mean, were you like competitive from day one as no. a child, or or? or... <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I'm competitive. Yes. Okay. Uh, um, you know, I I grew up playing baseball. You know, uh -huh. from okay. t-ball all the way through little league, and what we have here is called independent league. Yeah. Um, so it was like a city rec and another private league. I, I did that and I played through high school. Um, so competitively, you know, I did sports, but baseball was my thing as a kid. Um, and then through the Taekwondo days, we did a lot of, you know, Taekwondo and karate tournaments, the old point karate tournaments back when there was a little more contact than they do now. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I love that. So I, I had a lot of competition there. But the main reason I got in the ring to fight in, in Muay Thai and kickboxing was I, I thought to myself, you know, here I am going to be teaching people Muay Thai, kickboxing, Jeet Kune Do, martial arts, self-defense in general. But in the Muay Thai and the kickboxing, I'm, I'm like thinking, how am I going to tell these people what it's like or get them ready for a fight if I've never done it? Right. So. That's what initially got me to train for a fight and try a fight. Um, but then once I did it, I loved it. But I, w I just wanted to prove to myself I could do it and then have that to say to my students, okay, you need to do this because when you fight, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. um, so that's initially why I, I started in getting in competition. So, so you, okay. So do you accept students only the ones who want to compete? No. Ah. Okay. No, I, out of all my students, I mean, I only have a handful that, that fight. Right. Um, so what did, why, are, why are the others there? <laughs> well, they, they, it's, a, it's a great workout, and it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's fun. You yeah. know, I mean. Uh, training with you is, training with you is fun. It seems to be the, the most popular right now for us. Yeah, but training with you is fun. Well, they might, my students might not say it. Depends what, what kind of day it is and uh, <laughs> if we're training for a competition or, or what. But yeah, yeah, we, you know, we joke around, we have fun. But, you know, it's Kali and Jeet Kune Do, I feel, and Muay Thai for that matter, it's for everyone. Hmm. You know, in Muay Thai, even though, you know, not everyone's fighting and not everybody has to train like they're fighting, but it's just fun to hit the pads. It's a great workout. Um, and just to learn what your body can do. I tell my students, even the ones that aren't, aren't competitive fighting, and they'll never fight. I said, we're all fighting something. We're all training for a fight. Yeah. Whether it's, I need to lose 10 pounds. Yeah. I, 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 I had a really crappy day. I yeah. need to, I'm, I'm in a fight with this stress. I got to get the stress out of my system. You know, uh, I want to prove to myself I can do something. Or maybe it's a non-athletic person, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So a non-athletic person comes and they can find out, you know what? I can do things that are right. quote unquote yeah. athletic, you know, yeah. I, I can learn, you know, well, and you're, you're a great example for those people because you said Luke is now bigger. He's now heavier than you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> No, it's been I obvious mean, in the picture. Yeah, but you, but I mean, but you're still. I think you're probably still in pretty good shape. You know, for yeah, some for somebody you. in his thirties. Yeah, right, right. Thirties. Right. <laughs> that that was a while back. <laughs> no, my son's a lot a lot lighter than me. Uh, yeah. He fights at one fifty five, uh, one fifty three for the tournament. Um, 
my lightest I ever fought at was 182. Now I'm about two. Too much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so Rick Fay once said about Muay Thai, right? He said, Thai boxers stand in, in front of each other and throw bombs. Mm -hmm. Right? So, how do, how do, how in Muay Thai, how do they train defensive and countering skills if that's mm -hmm. what they're doing? Standing in, in range and just throwing bombs at each other. When, well, when. You... Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I just, you know, there's, there's so many different styles of fighter in Muay Thai. You know, you do have those guys that stand toe to toe and throw, but you also have the technician and, and the knee fighter or the, or the kicker, you know. Okay. Um, it's, it's all in, in the way you train. It's not, uh, I mean, it, it's like when you see, for example, my son and I are two different styles. Uh -huh. He's much more, uh, uh, I, he's kind of a combination of, of a technician and a, and a knee specialist, but he also is, is, is good with his hands. Me, I was more kick kicker. Right. Um, and I, I definitely wasn't as fast as my son. He's a lot quicker than me and faster and, and smooth. So mine was built on the power with the kick. I was, I was, I was trying to bust your leg in two. That's what, that was what I was with my son he'll he'll play more technician and, and use that movement and setups and fakes um i think anymore there's no pure where they're just standing and banging as much as you know everybody's trying to uh more be more well-rounded and, and kind of cross train in other other parts you know yeah we'll incorporate a lot of boxing training into our muay thai program and in some of the kickboxing things too. It's not all just straight Muay Thai. Yeah. Well, when somebody comes in after they've been training for a while, can you kind of identify what style of fighter they, they are or what style of fighting would be best for them? Yeah. I mean, you'll, you'll pick up on, you know, like when you're teaching a class, for example, you may be showing the whole class, this is the combination. This is the drill, you know. Right. But when you're training specific people for the ring, you got to kind of build on their strengths and improve their weaknesses. So, but you take whatever their strengths are, you know. Uh, my son's height, for example, you know, he's tall and skinny. So uh, we, we kind of molded toward that uh, mm -hmm. kind of copying off of, uh, you know, probably the most famous – Muay Cow or knee fighter is Diesel Noy, yeah. and he was a tall, thin Thai, but kind of built like my son. So we kind of incorporated a lot of that type of fighting. Um, I have another fighter, uh, Jack Edens. He's he's a little different. He's more of a puncher, and I kind of uh, pattern his style more like a, a John Wayne Parr. You know, we kind of incorporate some of that. Um, you kind of see where their strong points are. And you can't, you can't put everybody into the same box, you know? Yeah, yeah. So some fighters, you'll see what they're naturally prone to right. and try to build on that. Right, yeah. Um, you, you talked about, about, you know, the fact that, that everybody's in a fight and um, of some sort, and that's why the training is good. Uh, but now, literally in Muay Thai, how do, how do they train to, to withstand the punishment? Because, because yeah. you know, because you'll see a guy recover from getting the crap beat out of him, <laughs> and then he takes over the fight. So, I mean, is, is there like specific training for withstanding punishment? I, you know, a lot of people want to know what that that secret mystical thing is, you know, and the the the, the secret I learned. I go back to Sifu Rick. He told me the secret to martial arts, and he said the secret to martial arts is there are no secrets. Yeah. Um, but as far as, you know, it, body tempering is what we call it, you know. Right. You'll do different things. Uh, just the training itself, you know, you want to toughen your shins up. There's no secret method to iron palm training for your shins. It's, it's kicking a bag, kicking the tie pads. You know, you're desensitizing those nerves in, mm -hmm. your, in your shin and you, your shins get tougher. Um, you know, it's sparring and doing timing you're starting to, to 
to temper the body a little bit. We do some drills where you're kick, kicking your partner's legs and, and working their midsection just to get the body used to that impact. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the more you train, the harder you train, um, and incorporating some of those, those methods, your body kind of gets used to it. It's, it's, it's like any sport. I'd imagine, you know, the football players, you know, how do they get used to, to that high level uh, almost like a car crash every Sunday, right? Their body's right. in a car crash every Sunday, basically. Yeah. But yet the next week they got to play and in two days they got to recover and go back to practice. Your body just starts to adapt and, and get used to it. Plus, you know, a lot of it is heart, you know, not everybody reacts the same. You know, I've seen some fighters that maybe didn't have the technique or skill, but they had that heart and that will yeah. and that carried them through where you see another guy who could has the most pretty technique and and their their form is perfect but boy uh as soon as they get that get tagged they, they're looking for the exit and they're they're looking for their mama you know yeah um what about the non-fighter students that do do you do the body temperance stuff on them also no no that's no. that's mainly yeah. the fight have through the week and yeah. then we have fighter training so okay. anybody that's on our fight team they'll attend those fighter trainings they'll come to the muay thai classes too yeah, um, but we'll do different, little different things for conditioning wise in those fighter trainings than uh, than the class. We'll still add some, you know, calisthenics and you know, crunches, push ups, things like that. But right. the body tempering stuff that's mainly for the people that are fighters. What What about heart in a non fighter student? Say that again. What about heart in a uh -huh. non fighter student? How, how, what, what are you looking for there? How do you try to build that? How does it manifest itself? I think you got to be positive with your students. You know, not everybody learns at the same rate. Um, mm -hmm. And not everybody uh, is athletically uh, blessed at the same either. So yeah. you got to look at each student individually and uh, kind of look at, how they're progressing their strong points. You got to encourage their strong points, but you also got to, I guess, be familiar enough with them to know when you got to jump them a little bit to lift them back up. If they're falling behind, right. You know, it's, I guess it goes back to also thinking, you know, everybody's fighting training for a fight of some sort. Yeah. So I kind of look at it that way with, you know, what is it that's going to motivate them? There's got to be something you can find that's either uh, some people need to have their ass chewed and then they'll get going. Some mm -hmm. people, if you chew their ass out, then they're going to just crumble on you. So right. you kind of got to find that. Balance. You got to be a psychologist. A little bit. I think you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that part? Your, don't you find that in your own? Gym? Yeah, but Sometimes but you, but this is the thing. Everything. But they never told us that in the beginning. No. Right. You know. You become and, a parent. You become the <laughs> teacher. You become the, uh, the psychologist. The confidant. The spouse. Yeah. You're, right. You gotta be every. You gotta wear every hat. Yep. And and then you gotta go home and do that for other people in your family. Right. Right. <laughs> right? Um, so when are you going to create the ultimate uh, tournament? Where, or, right, where we got the Jeet Kune Do sparring, we got the Muay Thai sparring, and we got the weapon sparring. When are you oh. going to create that tournament? I thought you were already doing that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know, I, I, you, know, you know, in all honesty, I have pretty much focused more on the competition with self aspect of, yeah. of martial art development. You know, that's always been, I, I, I coined the phrase, a, a long time ago that the art of self-defense is actually the art of self-development. That's beautiful. You, you, you know, so, so that, that really has, has always been my thing. Oh, you know what? Talking about competition. So here's another name, Raul Lopez. Oh, that's my Cuban brother. <laughs> I love Raul. Right. And he's still here in Miami, isn't he? Uh, he's back, yeah. He's back. In yeah, left for right? a while, but he's back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, so, 
so what is something about Muay Thai training or even martial art training that people don't know that you discovered? Well, I mean, for me, the training in Muay Thai was always something that I had no matter what kind of day I had for, or what I was going through in my life. Um, ah. And I, I went through some dark times, you know, back years ago. And I knew I, I could go to the gym and just zone out, do my pad rounds, bag work, whatever, get everything out of my system, yeah. kind of cleanse myself, yeah. uh, get that out. Or it was a fun way we, you know, to, on the high times too, when you're celebrating or when you're high on life, whatever, you know, it was mm -hmm. something that was always there. It wasn't, it didn't have any demands. Here's the heavy bag. Here's your partner with the tie pads. They don't care what you look like, what you feel like. They're going to be there to kick or punch, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And I like the definition of uh, Muay Thai, and I still use it, that Rick Fay did one time. I can't remember if we were at, at just a regular Muay Thai class or uh, it was at a seminar. But he said, Muay Thai is a martial art that when you first start, it's, it's difficult. You may be out of shape, and it's hard, and you're, you're huffing and puffing, and or your body's not coordinated. So it's really hard and it sucks. So you spend time getting better. You work really hard. And as you get better, the intensity goes up and it sucks. You never get to a, oh, I got it now and it's fine. I can do it. It's right. just the harder, you, the better you get, the harder you can go. The harder you go, the better you get. And it just keeps building. You're never in yeah. a place where you can coast and be comfortable and yeah I, I i said to my students when i explained that to them and i said this isn't a very good selling point to get people to come and do this but this is what it is and that's kind of that mentality i think uh in the midwest kind of groups uh we we kind of always had that blue collar mentality i'd like to say yeah you know, between uh ajan greg and sifu rick in, in minnesota and then we had uh Rick Salo and, and all the people affiliated with him in Chicagoland. And then we had me, my guys here. We had Pete Hetrick's guys, you know, John Failing in Madison, Wisconsin, and Troy Neindorf in Madison. That yeah. whole, they, We were all friends, and we were all kind of in this Midwest vicinity. We all kind of had that same mentality. Just just do it. Just, you right. Know, that hard work. And nope. That work yeah. Ethic. Right. Nobody was afraid of doing the work. Nope. Nope. Yeah. Okay, but now, as a big city boy, right, you know, okay, is that because there's nothing else to do in Iowa? <laughs> <laughs> well, that depends what you like to do, I guess. No, we don't have to take uh, fancy nightlife. You know? um, for a while, that's all I did do. That was my life, you know. Yeah. You know, trained, we would work my job 10 hours a day, go to the yeah. gym. Weekends, yeah. what do you do? You go to the gym or you're at a seminar somewhere, but – but we had social at night at the seminars, you know, that's when you'd get together with your friends, yeah. you know, we'd go out and hang out and talk and have a few yeah. drinks, whatever, you know, get up and go train and what, whatever. But yeah. it, it was, it was the lifestyle. Yeah. That was the lifestyle. Yeah. Um, me and uh, Neil Colliff and I, right. Uh, social night at the CMA camps in St. Louis, they would play enter the dragon and we would uh -huh. sit in the back and we would just recite the script because we knew it by heart. <laughs> <laughs> Seen it once or twice, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. So listen, I want to be respectful of your time. So I want to start uh, cl closing this down. So sure. um, do, do this for me. Future of Muay Thai in America. What's the future of Muay Thai in America? Well, I think right now the future of, of Muay Thai in America is really bright. You've got the United States Muay Thai Federation – who's trying to, uh, one, they're trying to grow the amateurs and improve the skill of the amateurs with the Youth Development League. Um, they're, they're, with, this, with that, that's kind of training the young guys out. That's going to be the future champions. The USMF okay. is, is working toward trying to get uh, Muay Thai as an Olympic sport. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're doing things where uh, – you know, they're taking a team to Thailand here in July. My son actually was 
uh, chosen to be on Team USA um, for the, the World Muay Thai IFMA tournament. But um, right. I think Muay Thai in the United States is in a good place right now. We are a little behind on the world stage. Okay. But I think the future looks bright, like with uh, what USMF is trying to do is to standardize the refereeing and the scoring and the judging. So it's, okay. right now it's kind of tough because, uh, you know, you've got 50 states, but within each state you could go from event to event and there's so many different rule sets. Well, you know, this sanctioning body, we do this. This sanctioning right. body, it's, these are the rules. Well, right. you, you know, is it, is it Muay Thai? Is it Muay Thai light? Is it kickboxing? Is it K1 rules, glory rules? glory rules with this modification or Muay Thai rules with this modification. They're trying to get everything standardized. Yeah. And I think in the end, there's going to be things that, you know, some people may like, may not like, but if we can get a unified standardized set of scoring, judging rules, that makes it easier for all of us. Okay. To get our athletes ready and on a, the, on a good, uh, good place right. for, for international competition on the world stage. And I think the amateurs right now that you'll see uh, developing in the youth development league or some of the guys that are attending these tournaments, like the Thai boxing sanctioning authorities, world expo that's happening in a couple of weeks down in Des Moines mm -hmm. um, and, and the various tournaments around. I mean, I think Muay Thai in America is, is strong and getting stronger. I, okay. I, I think it's got a bright future. Um, do the week does WeCAF still have tournaments? Do they still have stick fighting tournaments? You know, I'm not sure. I kind of have lost uh, touch with uh, Grandmaster Tom Sip in, in Milwaukee. Okay. I don't know if they're still how strong they are. I, I, I imagine they probably are. So you um, can answer the question: What's the future of Kali in America? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I. I love it no matter what. I'm still right. going to train it, you know. I mean, what about the future of Jeet Kune Do in America? Well, I don't think that's ever going anywhere. There's too many of them. <laughs> <guys around, right? laughs> All right. Okay. All right. This is the last one. This, I, I swear to you, I'm not going to go off on a tangent. Absolute last question. <laughs> have you guys gone to see John Wick 3? I have not seen it yet, no. Okay. All right. Well, I was going to ask you for your opinion, but I, I guess I'll, I'll have to bring you back and get your opinion on it. <laughs> yeah, that, you yeah. know, and, uh, it, you know, that, that movie there, there's so much uh, connection to the Inosano, you know, uh, bloodline. Yeah. You could say, you know, yeah. Dave Leach I, and, and Chad, yeah. you know. I try to make sure that people are – that the general public is aware of that. Yeah. You know, because I don't – I mean, and then in that way, there is a Bruce Lee connection to John Wick Most as, as well. You know? Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. All right. Well, listen, man. Right? This was fun. I re I'm serious about bringing you back. You know? Um, yeah, no problem. But next time you come back, you got to tell everybody about the necklace. <laughs> you get <laughs> no problem you gotta break that down for them my brother all right all right okay all right so head off to wherever it is you gotta go have a good time right and thanks for doing this again man i appreciate it no problem it's good to, uh good to see you and good talking to you again man it's been a long time i know i know all right you take care all right man take care all right